Now that you've found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com. And greetings and salutations, everyone. You have tuned in to, once again, to Dr. Judy WTF for What the Freud. I'm your host here at Walt Lusk, and of course, Dr. Judy Rosenberg, the founder of Dr. Judy Rosenberg and the Psychological Healing Center um, and other things. And of course, the world-renowned international author of Be the Cause, Healing Human Disconnect. And we broadcast every Thursday at 8 o'clock Pacific here in the Los Angeles area at the Sunset Gower Studios in the heart of Hollywood in the Gower Gulch. And um, we are a psychological-based show and a call-in show. So if you want to call in and get on the couch with Dr. Judy with your emotional ouch, feel free. And the number is area code 843-2826. That's 843-2826. Or if internationally you want to do that and you're up, which we love it when you are, at uh, on Skype at UBN Radio number 2. We have been last week. We had a great show with uh, one of uh, Dr. Judy's therapists, uh, Jay Clapperman, and we talked about how to talk to a narcissist. And it was a really great show. We had some amazing calls. And this week, we're going to talk a little bit about um, narcissism again, uh, this time regarding death and expectations. And we're going to get into that. And I hope we're going to dive into maybe an article I found, which is just very juicy, doctor, okay. on seven things the narcissist absolutely hate that you aren't supposed to do around them. So hopefully we'll have time with that one. And later we're going to do a song. We shrink that tune every show. Um, this, uh, this one's an interesting one by request again. And uh, you can catch us on iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and of course, YouTube. And thanks so much for all your subscribing and comments. Well, uh, narcissism is a very, very hard-shelled kind of a defense mechanism. And um, that term, narcissism, has been tossed around a lot. And what I'm, I'm meaning it to mean from all the readings that I've done and all the work that I've done uh, with patients is that narcissism is a defense against an injury. And the injury has to do with being either overspoiled and um, smothered by a mother uh, so that that person thinks that they're the golden child and they're uh, up on a pedestal. And then when they come into the reality of the world, the world doesn't think so. And then they're injured because they fall off the pedestal. Or, um, they don't, or they don't want to fall off the pedestal. Or they don't want to fall off the, <laughs> yeah, the that's pedestal. That's the whole point. They want to stay on the pedestal. Right. Or, or, or it's born out of, a, uh, of an injury of, um, of, of a parent, usually mother, sometimes father, uh, whereby they don't get enough of the narcissistic supply. So then they um, feed off of other people to get their narcissistic supplies. And so then they uh, become kind of like emotional vampires and they use people emotional and then uh, they, they, they get the message early in life that people are not really to be relational with. They're just to be used because there is no such thing as real love. There is no such thing as real connection. So empathy. it's a very, yeah, it's a, no it's, a it's a severe lack of empathy and a, and a real inability to connect. It's uh, kind of like the, um, the definition of, of human disconnect, if you will. And um, the three hallmarks of narcissism is they tend to demean, devalue, and destroy. So uh, some people uh, live with narcissists, they're married to them, or their parents are narcissists, and they're hoping that as the narcissist ages, this 
the shell is going to crack and they're going to become more human and they're going to be more accessible and all the pain and suffering that they inflicted on other people will finally come to a halt and there will be a grand apology at the end and a, a, a kind of a grand, uh, oh my God, I can't believe I did this to you all my life and, you know, I'm so sorry and, you know, and please forgive me. And, and, uh, and, and so, Walt, why don't you speak about the likelihood of that happening? <laughs> This is a serious topic, Doctor. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, seriously. Well, the, the title of this one a little bit is, uh, we're going to, you know, don't wait for a narcissist to get sick and die. My father died recently. You can't escape from narcissists and their games, even when they die. Fact is, when they die, they often are more powerful than when they were alive. My father knew that and prepared for it. I knew, he, I knew he would, which is partly why I dreaded the day he would die. My mother knew about my father's death a whole month before she decided to contact me mm -hmm. and inform me of my passing. Why? You mean of his passing. Of his passing. And, the, and of course, the implication is that he basically, you know, just no, no contact whatsoever because, you know, he was a narcissist and it just didn't work out, right? Because my mom found out she could not get her hands on his inheritance without me. She needed me to use me to get what she wants. I'm keeping her ar I, I am keeping her at arm's length at the moment, and I know it won't last. The lovely, quiet, simple life I had finally managed to create for myself is crumbling away into a sticky quagmire of complications. Wow. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> there is more, but... That so I want to address some of the comments that we've been receiving on our YouTube episodes and... Uh, some people respond to, how do you talk to a narcissist? Well, one good answer is don't, okay? It's don't a very talk common to an, a it's narcissist. It's a very common and, answer. And if you don't have to, then I, I support that, then, then don't, okay? But sometimes it's strategic to talk to a narcissist because that person happens to be your mother or your father. And um, what's worse than a narcissist injuring you all your life is for that narcissistic parent to die and then leave you with, Zippo zero. It's very, very painful when they donate their funds to a charity or a cousin or somebody that um, you happen to hate and they want to revenge donate to somebody like that. It's very painful. So sometimes I advise people to be strategic. Uh, just because the injury is going to be too grand. And, and, and frankly, the, some people are going to give up an awful lot of funds to, um, to, 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 to not be strategic. So, 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 you know, it's a fine line. So if you're going to really, really injure yourself as a result of contact with a narcissist, then please don't, okay? And if you feel that you're going to injure yourself because you don't play it strategically, then please do. Okay, so in this particular case, um, the father wants to continue to control the situation beyond death. Beyond the grave. And beyond the grave. And so I think in this case, he's done a good job because now um, mother and son are needing to uh, interact with each other in order to, I guess, sign off on an inheritance or to co-sign for the inheritance, whatever is the situation. Uh, so um, very interesting. So this narcissistic shell, which is a tough one to crack, very. oftentimes does not crack easily e even upon death. Um, I have a little story about my own personal life, and I, I love my father very, very much. He's one of the most interesting, funny, intelligent people I, I knew. Uh, very blunt, but definitely he had some narcissistic tendencies. And actually, he must not have been a full-blown narcissist because when he was dying, he broke down. His narcissistic shell cracked. And what came out of his mouth were interesting things like, nothing matters, money doesn't matter, screw money, the only thing that matters is family. And I can remember him crying into this big beach towel. That's how, how upset he was about all of this. And But yet upon his death, and I was at his deathbed, which was very interesting, he was so proud that he refused to die in front of me, okay? So one of the things he did before he died, the day before he died, for some reason, 
they wanted a urine sample from him. And it was ridiculous because he only had like a day or two left in him. He was down to bare bones, dying of pancreatic cancer. So um, I took this urine sample and I said, hey, dad, what should I do with it? And he went like, like this, like drink it. So the sarcasm was really there. The humor was really there. But what was really interesting is that he died as he lived. He had to have control. So the moment I went to the bathroom to wet a towel to wipe his mouth was when he slipped out the back jack. That's when he died. I was in the room the whole time, but there was only oh, like wow. maybe a minute that I left the room, and oh. that's when he took the opportunity. It's oh, like, man. no, 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 I'm not going to. Oh, wow. I'm not going to be vulnerable here. I'm just going to do it when she's gone. So it's very, very interesting. That's how, control, boy. Yeah, that's control. But, you know, in his case, he did crack. The, his shell did crack. But in some instances, the shell does not crack, and this apology, this big awaited apology uh, never comes. And sometimes it's even worse than that. Sometimes they will revenge up until death, like pull out the inheritance or do something that will make them be remembered in a way where the um, the person that that's the, the, the wife or the son or the daughter will, um, will hurt beyond the grave. Well, here, here's, here's a little more. There are many individuals who lead their lives in infinite holding patterns in their relationships with narcissists, whether it be a spouse, a mother, or a father. They suspend their days waiting for the narcissist who has caused them extreme emotional and psychological harm and horrible suffering, mm -hmm. thinking that there will be some justice, right. in effect, waiting for them to fail, to hit bottom, and even die. This is not going to happen in almost every single case. Narcissists, if you give them the opportunity, they are hell-bent on it and will make you sick literally. Mm -hmm. They use people to the max, including their spouses, children, and siblings. If you are married to a narcissist and, and they become ill, they will replace you with someone else. You can take that one to the bank. Yeah. They'll never yeah. stop helping uh, anybody but themself. So this lack of empathy, and speaking of death, so if a narcissist spouse dies, let's say, then Walt, that's 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 true. They'll replace the I'll person because they've learned. They've mm -hmm. learned that um, relationships are not really intimate. They're not about love and certainly not about unconditional love. They are about um, esteeming themselves themselves so as soon as one object and that's how they do it they objectify people as soon as one object dies then they will replace that object um, with another object and um, oftentimes the families will go ballistic because their father hasn't even in their mind finished grieving their mother before a new woman shows up and oftentimes that new woman um, herself is, um, well, I've seen cases, I have one case where the new woman is a, a, a kind of like a black widow where she's also you, there to use, use the person. Well, of course. And especially in the, you know, the golden later years later where, uh, where, where there's a, a, a need for security, there's a need for financial security. So you'll see one black widow latch on to another person and suck them dry, and the children are screaming bloody murder. Yep. Dad, Dad, my inheritance is going to this this bitch that you've only known for you know a handful of months. What's going on here? And the the, the father's saying, shh, 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 you know, don't ruin the relationship. You don't know what you're saying. And so, um, so the loyalty goes to the person who's providing the supplies. So if the person, the black spider, is p providing the, um, the, the esteem, the sex, the, the companionship, and so on, then the children are pretty much out of luck because they're not going to be able to compete. And, of course, there's no real bond there and there's no real empathy, so there's nothing holding the system together. No, there's really yeah. nothing holding us right. together. How about the aging narcissist? Growing not old, good, not good. <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> Growing old requires grace and courage. Mm -hmm. Grace and courage are not attributes the narcissist possesses at any age. So, the lack of these virtues becomes all the more apparent as they grow old. 
The final act on the stage of life seems to be pulling back the curtain of the soul, but not with a narcissist. Narcissists don't age well. Whether they depend on their beauty or their intellect, now they find themselves unable to summon the charm or sophistication mm -hmm. that enabled them to lure people in the sources of their supply. They are um, very pathonic and lonely. Neither their bodies nor their minds are impressive in any sense. Withered and shrunken, their minds and bodies are now betraying them. Mm -hmm. They are uh, daily confronted with the huge gap, whether they fraternize themselves, fantasize themselves and be, uh, to be and what the mirror on the wall says they are, the grandiosity gap. And they do oftentimes visit the plastic surgeon oh, more often goodness. than yes. the, the normal Botox. average person. The other day I was at an event, Walt, and there was a woman there. I'm sure she must have been in her 70s, and her breasts preceded the entrance <laughs> of the woman. <laughs> well, that's quite her, a statement. That's quite a. <laughs> oh, it was a, her waist. Oh. Her waist was liposuction down to the bare minimum. Oh, so she man. had these big breasts, a tiny little cinched waist with a belt. Corset. And, her, and I think what they did was they took the fat from her waist and they stuffed it into her bottom. So she really had everything so she, she's coming had a big hourglass figure huh? very hourglass uh she yeah. looked like um uh, yeah and bleach blonde hair of course and red lipstick and um and collagenized lips and i'm sure she's had had she had had many facelifts and so on and everybody was staring at her and then her husband made a speech about her it was amazing that he lined up to meet her and he was the lucky man because he got her, and he got the prize. And um, people were looking at her, and you, you couldn't really tell whether they were looking at her because she was so beautiful <laughs> or if they were looking at her because she was just so unusual. So, so Unusually when you see, beautiful. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you see people who overdo like this, uh, it, it, you know, it's oftentimes, um, as, as I say in my book, the hieroglyphics, the symptoms point to the cause. So here's a person who does not want to um, face her crumbling the self. Reality. It's just too painful. Yeah. So she's going to keep um, she's going to keep the image up as long as she could. Um, so so that's another thing. Not only do narcissists not die well, right? They don't age well. No, they which don't. Is another form of death is yes. that when we wither away, we don't. They don't do well with that because. Really, they don't invest in. Um, they don't invest in. There's a stage of development at the end of life. I believe it's called um, generativity, paying it forward. So some people degenerate, and some people generate, and some people who are aging take pride in the fact that they can pay it forward. They can be a contribution um, to society, and in the case of narcissists. Um, they're usually on the degenerating end because their supplies don't involve being um, givers. Their supplies don't necessarily involve um, uh, being magnanimous, unless, of course, it's for the image. We've talked about that before, that sometimes they're wonderfully charitable people. Why? Because their name is going to be on the building. They're going to look good. They're going to look good. Yeah. So the consciousness behind their giving or their intention behind the giving is to esteem themselves. A little more in this article real quick. Um, what you're witnessing in this instance from their perspective is a three-year-old trapped in an old man's or an old woman's body. Mm -hmm. The temper tantrum that could pass for cute in toddler is shockingly and just deplorable when performed as they age. Some elderly narcissists are so evil and nasty that families find that outside agencies will even refuse to deal with them, thus leaving the family with no options but to care for the wrinkled beast themselves. And unfortunately, because they don't invest in their children and their families and they don't nourish yeah, and nurture, <laughs> at the end of their life, they're not very liked. I had an old woman who came to see me many years ago when I was an intern. I think I brought up this case before. And um, I didn't really quite know what I was doing because it was my first trimester in school. And she walked into the room and she was one of these Hollywood characters. She was very... Actually, she was very nice looking for her age, and she was quite famous in her own um, area. And um, I don't even know what she was doing at a clinic. She should have been 
uh, in, in a private practice setting, but nonetheless, she picked me to be her therapist, or maybe I was assigned to her. And uh, uh, one of the first things she did when she walked into the room was she started to demean, devalue, and destroy everything, how ugly the room was and how I probably was too young to treat her and that I, you know, I didn't have my Ph.D. at the time. And then I stopped and I looked at her and I said, at first I was very intimidated because I, I started questioning myself. Am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Am I experienced enough? And then it dawned on me that, this is what she does. She's testing you. Okay. She's and testing. so I said to her, do you, do you treat everybody like this? And she kind of bowed her head and said, yeah. And I said, now I understand why you're here and how painful it must be for you. Because you mentioned that your son doesn't want to talk to you and your daughter doesn't want to talk to you. And her friends are kind of fading away. And so narcissists oftentimes die alone. And the only thing that keeps people hanging around is their narcissistic supplies. So if they have their fame, if they have their beauty, if they have their money, those are their supplies. They're it. Yeah, that's it. Right. So it, there's an article here, The Dangers of Expecting a Deathbed Apology from Your Narcissistic Mother. We're going to pick on moms today. Okay. So the first one is The Disappointment of Expecting an Apology. Mm-hmm. A sincere apology invi- involves taking responsibility for your actions and expressing remorse for those actions. Mm-hmm. My, narcissistic, my narcissistic mother never sincerely apologized for anything to anyone. However, there was a non-apology given to another family member prior to her death. It consisted of subtly shifting the blame away from her to another. Mm-hmm. Um, even even this was issued under the public pressure with an audience of, and there's a lot of instances of flying monkeys. You know, they're going to tell the flying monkeys to go, and which is of course from the words of the boss, and to do, their bidding, right? and to do yeah. their bidding right. and to go do their mm-hmm. stuff and do their thing. And mm-hmm. so, as long as they have flying monkeys around, they're going right. to be just great. Mm-hmm. My narcissist mother never apologized to me, nor she even acknowledge any of her abuse. If anything, she aggressively did everything in her power to take her scapegoats down. Her, her charade continued to the end. Even uh, the preacher at the funeral made a joke at the expense of her children. At the expense of her children. Yes. Yeah. The laughter rang out throughout the room. I mean, it was just like... So the whoa. preacher became one of her flying monkeys. Yeah, oh, exactly. I mean, even in death. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Okay. So, um, so, so again. Nope. You know what? We got it. We've got it. I just know. Okay. Got call. Awesome. Hi. Thanks for calling. You're on the couch with Dr. Judy. Hello. Oh, well, that was easy. Okay. Call back. They didn't want to talk to us. I guess it was the previous show. Okay. Expecting an apology sets you up for more narcissistic abuse. When your defenses are down, thinking surely there's got to be a deathbed apology and mercifully closure, merciful closure before saying goodbye, the predatory nature of the pathological narcissism remains. Do not make the mistake of attributing normal human emotions to a narcissist. My mother's actions clearly demonstrate that while making amends was the furthest thing from her mind, attempting to make sure that the truth was never revealed or believed after her passing was a very top priority. She was manipulating right up to the last moments of her life. Well, one of the hallmarks of mental health is the ability to self-reflect and Uh, self-correct. Since narcissists lack compassion, it's really difficult for them to connect their words and deeds uh, and the impact they have on other human beings. The only thing they're concerned about is their feelings and how they're viewed. So other people obviously don't count. Uh, So that apology is not coming because that person cannot put themselves in another's shoes. They, They just genuinely just can't do it. It's, they don't, they don't have the the uh, the the empathy for for this no, kind of a um, it's not in the DNA. this kind of a, a, a conversation. So, um, but the wishful thinking of the person who's been injured, you know, it's very very sad because they've taken so much demeaning and devaluing and destroying, and they think, wow, you know, this shell just just has to crack, and there's <laughs> got to be a human being in there somewhere, and sometimes just there's just 
a shell of a person in there and uh and that, and 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 really no empathy in there at all so to protect yourself by so protect yourself by never being alone with a family member with a family member with a narcissistic personality disorder being bring someone with you and ha- that has not been caught up in the sticky web of high levels of pathological narcissism creates and here's the sick part okay that the narcissistic parent will create a negative core belief in their children a, yes, a negative core belief like mm-hmm. you're not good enough or you're you don't matter or you're not important or you're not uh, lovable or you're not smart or you're not beautiful or something of the sort and so that's the hook in because they set the person up to feel that way and so at the end of their life they just stick it in them remember the story about the scorpion and the snake I, remember well, was, the I, scorpion was, and, and, the frog. and the frog sorry <laughs> right and I do. they're in i think they're in the ocean and so it's actually the, it's actually a little pond Pond. And the scorpion, wa- the, okay. the scorpion wants to get across the pond. Okay. And so the scorpion asks the frog, hey, can you give me a ride across the pond? And the frog goes, well, I could, but I'm not going to because, you know, you're a scorpion. You're going to sting me and I'm going to die. He goes, no, 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 I promise I won't. I just need to get across the pond. So the frog relents and says, okay. Halfway through their trip across the pond, the scorpion stings and kills the frog. And as the frog is dying, he said, you promised you wouldn't sting me. Mm-hmm. And the scorpion responds, but it's in my nature. Right. Exactly. Expecting a terminal... It's very yeah. deep. Yeah. It's definitely in their DNA, as I say. Expecting a terminally ill narcissist to apologize sets you up for even more narcissistic abru- abuse by proxy. My narcissistic mother was the master manipulator. Uh, highly charged co- emotions caused those close to the situation to be easily manipulated into abuse by proxy. A variation of this previously mentioned scenario occurred. The narcissist abuses, abuses privately, then claims to be the victim and accuses the true victim of being the abuser. She flips the script. Um, this often results the victim being a abused by the narcissist, then shunned, ostracized, or again abused by the people who believe the false accusations. And it's very, very confusing. And that's confusing. more, more fly, flying monkey stuff. It's, it's very confusing for the, the children, even if they're adult children, because we all want to please our mothers, okay? And so yes, our mothers, our fathers, they, they know this. And children, by nature, make themselves wrong. And so um, they're already uh, predisposed to blame themselves and shame themselves. So all the parent has to do is trigger their neg- negative core belief and they buy in and then they go down and mom and dad get to steam themselves in the process so one it's always one is up and the other one is down but the one that is up is is up at the expense of the other person's down so it's just a horribly sick uh system and the best thing to do is to have if you're going to be in the vicinity of a dying narcissist, as Walt said, bring, some uh, bring support. somebody with you yeah. so that you don't feel that you're losing your mind. Right. Okay. And if you and if you don't if you don't think that this is going to go well at all, then um, some people just don't show up to their parents' dying moments. No, I have no, a few don't. people that I've talked to recently who've told me that they just decided not to be there. I have one patient that I'm working with right now, and he chose to not show up. For his father's funeral, he had had enough. And uh, there was an uh, article I read the for, same thing. Yeah, There's no reason had why had I enough. I didn't have a relationship with him in life. So how am I yeah. going to have one in death? And right, right, yeah. I just the pain was just too much for him right. to even open up those exactly. wounds. So exactly. you know what? I, I just completed the closure. Yeah. Their own closure was not to show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Lastly, we're talking about flying monkeys doing their bidding. They inflict even more abuse again by proxy. When a parent passes away, it can be an extremely stressful time. In a toxic family, no one deals with stress very well or in a very healthy manner. Instead, they often fall back into the old abuse patterns as their toxicity comes shining through. Right. 
So, um, you know, it could be the sister or the brother or whatever. Um, and, and, you know, um, we talked about the golden child, the lost child, and the, the scapegoat. scapegoat and we're going to talk about yes. the mascot. By request. By Some request, of you have noticed we, we missed the mascot. That, <laughs> we're gonna, we did bring up that we're going to talk yes. about the mascot or yes, the clown of the family yes, system. And we, we will are. do that next week. Okay. We'll do okay. Next week. Um, so actually tuned. not. Yeah. Next week. We next will week? do that next okay. week. All right. As long as it's not Christmas or one no, of those No, no. We're, we're still early enough in the end. Um, um, and I, I was thinking as a show, we might do uh, how to be stress-free or over, not to be so overwhelmed over the holiday. Over the holidays. Yeah. Um, so so, so got a couple of ideas. Yeah. So um, so what was I saying? I just lost my mind. Well, the, 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 the siblings do their bidding for the oh, primarily the scapegoat. Oh, but I was talking about how narcissists set up horrible family systems. So. They do. When, the, when the siblings don't get along, it's the, the cause behind their not getting along is always the parent, the blueprint, because narcissistically wounded parents will set their children up to uh, be, let's say, the golden child, and then the golden child will be that special child and will be that special child who is envied by the lost child or the scapegoat. So they're not really supporting uh, family unity here. They're really creating sibling rivalry. So more one, drama. Of the, um, one of the psycho inheritances that uh, narcissists leave Psycho behind. inheritances. <laughs> yeah, oh exactly. The multi-generational oh. psycho inheritance, oh. right? They leave behind is just a mess of a family system with people arguing and people um, angry that one got more money than the other and one got the jewelry and then the other one didn't. And so, uh, again, they just somehow love the idea that they're going to be thought of. It doesn't matter how they're going to be thought of, but they will not be forgotten. And that is key to them. They will not be forgotten. Narcissists in a family will often gang up and tag team the scapegoat, which allows the narcissistic mother to inflict even more physical abuse, then put the blame on the children as if she had nothing to do with it or was even trying to stop it. Right. So, so they set up the they, dominoes, set up the and dominoes beep. fall apart, and then they extricate themselves, disassociate themselves and, from and, the system that and they created. And it's not their fault, and they don't take the blame, and they just sit there no. and watch the drama and they how do. they started the whole thing. They just watch thing. everything fall to pieces. You know, right. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, in conclusion, from this person's perspective, whether or not to visit the deathbed of a terminally <laughs> ill narcissistic uh, individual is a personal choice, mm -hmm. and we we each must make it ourselves. However, the expectation of apology is nearly certain to end in disappointment. Right. Um, another oftentimes brought up theme is, is this nature or is nature this or nurture? nurture? Yeah. MRI yeah. show that yeah. narcissists yeah. have different areas of, of the, the brain. brain that are smaller and so on and so forth. And uh, whether it's nature or nurture, I don't think anybody has quite um, brought it down to a science uh, because even if certain areas of the brain uh, is smaller because of... Um, of, of um, an MRI showing it to be that way, it, the mind and the body are interconnected, okay? So emotional injuries are going to show up physically. So if somebody's emotionally injured, there are going to be physical manifestations of that. And so it's hard to say, was that person born that way? So I, I think Drew Pinsky has a good way of um, explaining nurture, nature that... Dr. Drew. Yeah, Dr. Drew. He says something, he, he talks about addiction, but, in, in, you know, and the way he explains it is that nature sets it up and then nurture pulls the trigger. Hmm. Okay? Okay. Yeah. So we, we may have yeah. some genetic propensities toward, but those gene those propensities may never manifest if the environment is um, not stressful, if the environment is loving, if the environment is nurturing, then those um, those manifestations just may stay dormant all throughout a person's life. So in my opinion, as a psychologist and having treated so many people, I think that uh, these narcissistic injuries are have a cause behind them. And the cause has to do with the way a person has been nurtured. And if a person doesn't get their narcissistic supplies, there is great correlation between people who are demeaned, devalued, destroyed, um, neglected, 
so on and so so forth and abused and their level of narcissism and psychopathology and, and so on. And, and I see this every day in my treatment room. So as far as I'm concerned, there's a huge uh, uh, nurture component in the formation of this particular uh, dis-ease and defense mechanism. Which again begs the multi-generational theory. Right. Right. So yeah. I, I believe, I still believe, and this is one of the first things I say in my book, Be the Cause Healing Human Disconnect. I say that we're born, we're born healthy and we're made sick. We're born yep. healthy. And we're made sick. There's nothing, nothing unhealthy about us when we come out of the womb unless there's some kind of tumor, biochemical imbalance or some sort of a, 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 an in utero trauma. But in general, we're okay and then what's not okay is our, the way we're treated. And when we're not treated okay, we're going to have reactions to those wounds. And those wounds are going to encode. And they're going to take us on a WTF ride, which is a what the Freud ride, which is a repetitional pr uh, principle ride into chaos defenses and breakdowns. If you don't mind putting the mind map up so people and can actually see absolutely. what's going on. And those of you that are watching it uh, and listening to this, actually, you can go to drjudywtf.com and see it as well. There you go. So if you look at the top third of the mind map, you will see uh, the word wound, reaction, and encoding. And these are our wounds of the past, which include uh, neglect, uh, verbal, physical, sexual abuse, and uh, smothering. And if we're injured, we're going to have reactions to these wounds, and these reactions will eventually encode into a negative core belief like, I don't matter, I'm not lovable, I'm not good enough, and so, so on and so forth. And so when life trips us up and puts stress on us and hurts our feelings and hurts our, 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 our psyche, then we get triggered into chaos, we break down into chaos, and then we defend. And the narcissistic defense specifically is a defense against connection, human connection. So they will keep shelter. They will coat their emotions so that they don't want to be vulnerable. Anything they possibly so it, can it's, to do that. Right. It's a hardened shell. Yeah. So they're not going to be vulnerable to having interconnection with people. And eventually uh, what happens is, they break other people down. You know the old, uh, old question of do you give heart attacks or do you get heart attacks? Okay, so the narcissist will give heart attacks, yes, and yes. then the codependents uh, and the the people who are the, the the recipients of their woundings get heart attacks. So they don't know how to. Um, co-create with the relationship. They don't know how to have panel seven, eight, nine, which is a paradigm shift and connection, and they don't know how to create healing and peace on earth. They just don't have the ability to do that. Wow. This this one I want to really touch on um, a little more about terminal illnesses and the death of a narcissistic, and we just be picking mothers today. Um, several other issues. The one, this one really just, I don't know why, but it really hit me. The sacred okay. role of mother. Okay. The sacred belief is that mothers is the nurturer, defender, and the greatest ally to her children is deeply ingrained in most of us. It is certainly it is contrary to the nature of society to a mother of um, uh, to behave in any other way towards her children that might simply assume these qualities in a mother. The average person cannot begin to grasp the idea that a mother is in, in, inherent. In intentionally destroying their own child, especially if she manipulates it as a selfless saint. They have never witnessed just how fast that angel mask comes off, even the even dream of what is truly under the mask. Mm -hmm. A narcissistic personality disordered mother uses the sacred belief of motherhood to her full advantage. And therefore the guilt and the shame yeah. of the children who don't feel that much. I've had people say to me, you know, my mother died and I feel terrible about this, but I don't feel very much at all. And it's just a horrible feeling because people will pay their condolences and they'll expect them to be crying and upset. And then they think there's something wrong with them because they're just not feeling it. And the reason they're not feeling it is because love is earned. Okay. It's a sense of yeah. earnership. And if the mother didn't put the love in them, if they didn't put the compassion in them, then they can't expect them to feel compassion, um, uh, uh, 
upon the, on their deathbed or, or, you know, or to feel a sense of grief afterwards. So oftentimes what happens is they're grieving the mother or the father that they, they didn't have. Their loss that they didn't have, that, that they're didn't learning, have, that their right. learning is even a bigger loss because they didn't have it right. even in life and, and uh, even b- in bigger in death. Yes. Um, yeah. If anything, the manipulation with pity and guilt greatly increases during the stress of a terminal illness. Uh, narcissists are extremely jealous people, and they be, uh, believe others are jealous of them. Um, this is their final grand performance when they realize they're at the end. And my mother herself became more brazen and more abusive when she was terminally ill, and she knew it. As an example, um, the counterintuitive of what is normal, a healthy human being, um, belongs to what we do to contemplate another human being during this difficult time. However, I literally saw my mother instantly change her character several times depending upon who just walked in the hospital room. Mm-hmm. She, so be warned if you're a scapegoat because, boom, she's going to flip on a dime. Mm-hmm. Right. And you realize so, it right there, it's all a charade, it's all a so, show. So, so they really don't change, they just become more of who they are. The closer they come to death, the more they exaggerate those aspects of themselves that uh, we know is already there. Um, yeah. I had a, a, a case... Um, that I treated about a year ago and I just saw him recently and he chose to go no contact with his family of origin, with his mother and father. And he came from a very wealthy family and they were so injurious to his psyche. They were so demeaning of him and they were so controlling of him that he opted out and he basically let go of his inheritance and he had a nice inheritance coming to him and the entire family was on him with you know why don't you why don't you participate in this family why don't you respect your mother and father why don't you just quote behave according to the family uh, rules and it came down to a matter of his sanity um, he got so despondent that he he contemplated suicide although he was not actively suicidal I think he he just wanted to die his his reason for living just became uh, less and less, and he finally decided to pull the trigger on this one and not on himself. He pulled the trigger on contact with his parents, and he just left the family and left the city, and um, he had to go no, no contact not only with his parents but with some of the family members, yeah, family members that were well. their front flying monkeys. It's interesting. Several of the comments right. you guys made, I really appreciate it. Um, last week I gave an analogy really quick. Uh, if you're in a boat, you know, are you crew or are you cargo? Yeah. And he made the very huge, difficult, conscious decision that they were all cargo and he just didn't want to carry all that anymore. Yeah, just and, they, they and if a ship is sinking, health. yeah, and if a ship is sinking as you right. know, you need to throw stuff overboard to keep it from sinking. And the last and thing that's a, a child, what he did. right, the last thing the child wants to do is hurt their parents. Yeah. So, it's yeah. a really really it's heavy really decision tough. that they have to yeah. cut ties because yeah. ultimately a healthy individual is not going to throw themselves under the bus. If they have a choice between throwing their mother and father under the bus for their own mental health and uh, to help them escape from psychological prison, and, you know, our favorite line, Walt, is uh, you say it well. Oh, uh, childhood. Childhood is a hostage situation. Right, and even though people are not children at that stage, it's still a, 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 they they they're hostage to the family system. They're hostage to their negative core beliefs, and so some of them literally have to cut off from the family in order for to escape from this hostage. Um, Absolutely. Um, now let me touch health. on that real quick, and then we've got to go to our song. I got a couple more things mm, real quick. Okay. So as we've talked before, narcissists have their hallmarks are no remorse no empathy, no regrets, and they have an amazing sense of entitlement. But lastly, narcissists lies, gossip, slander, and flipped tales. Hmm. A narcissist's weapon of choice is often verbal slander, lies, playing the victim, and flipped tales. 
of who was the victim and who was the abuser, gossip, rage, verbal abuse, and intentional infliction of emotional pain. It's the systemic dem- demand, dem- dismantling of another person's relationships, reputation, emotional, physical, and spiritual health, life, and very soul. And that's exactly what happened to your patient. In he order badly, to win. He In basically to had win. to survive. He had to pull himself out of that. Right. This is why narcissists are so often called emotional vampires, as we talked about before. The um, in death, it's a cumulative results of this kind of behavior. Again, in my experience, the narcissist becomes even more aggressive during a terminal illness. They're constantly projecting their negative character traits onto others. Um, you know, did you catch the narcissist in a lie? They're they're going to call you a liar. Um, and uh, you're pro- you're you pride yourself on being honest and generous. Guess what? They're going to tell you you're not honest and you're not generous. So they're going to flip it all around, and you're a lying thief because you're not honest and generous. So if a narcissist mother does not love you, you have to likely be accused many times of not loving your mother. So they're flipping all this stuff around as a result of the infamous phrase and powerful word, projection. And it's very difficult to uh, to overcome. It's just really, really Because tough. the reason it's difficult is because the parent already set you up for feeling horrible about yourself. And so when they project, you identify with what they're saying. And then that's called projective identification. And then that person takes on that uh, energy. They take on those feelings. And then the narcissist gets to clear them out of the sister system. And the person that's projected on will be ingesting those feelings and um, the person who's been doing the projecting will evacuate their feelings right into their own children. It's a really nasty system. Very. So the bottom line is if you have a narcissistic parent and they're on their deathbed, you're might going to get a multiplication more, if not more of the same. And do not anticipate or expect any kind of breaking of their, of their shell cracking of their eggshell, or any form of admission or apology. It's just more of the same. Not likely. And Occasionally, it's just, it's but just, not likely. It's rare. Yeah. So don't set you up for disappointment. Just mm-hmm. figure out that's... And what, don't take it personally. And you can take it personally. No. That's that's all they know. Yeah. That's how they've gotten through life. Right. And that's pretty much how they go through death. Yeah. So now we're going to shrink our song here at Dr. Judy WTF, where I'm going to read some lyrics of a song, and uh, Dr. Judy's going to interpret it from her mind map psychological perspective. And this one's called Apologize. <laughs> and it's, it's by Timbaland, and uh, we're just going to start this. I'm holding on to your rope, got me 10 feet off the ground, and I'm hearing what you say, but I just can't make a sound. You tell me you need me, then you go and cut me down. But wait, you tell me that you're sorry. Don't think I turn around and say, that's it's too late to apologize. It's too late. I said it's too late to apologize. It's too late. Well, this reminds me of the ups and downs. So the parent is holding on to the rope of the victim. And um, the 10 feet off the ground means that, that they're, you know, for a moment they're idealizing the person. Um And I'm hearing what you say, but I just can't make the sound represents to me the powerlessness of the other person. And then they they turn around and say, you need me. But then they play with the feelings and they cut you down. So it's an up and down. They take you up and then they let you down and cut, cut you down. And then when you tell me that you're sorry, they they may say fakely, um, you know, I'm so sorry. Okay, just so that they don't cut the connection because they need you, yeah, need but they don't supply. count on another one mm-hmm. seeing the truth and um, seeing through this whole thing and saying, you know, I see who you are, and it's kind of too late to apologize. It's just too late. They're not counting on that line. They're not. I'll take, I take another chance, take a fall, take a shot for you, and I need you like the heart needs a beat, but that's nothing new. Oh, yeah. I love you with a fire red, with a fine red. Now it's turning blue. And you say, sorry, like an angel heaven. Let me think with you, but I'm afraid. It's too late to apologize. It's too late. I said it's too late to apologize. It's too late. 
Well, you know, again, the ups and downs and the lack of trust that anything is really going to be uh, genuine. And maybe the person did love the person, but now they're seeing that the love was not really true blue. The love is kind of uh, growing cold and they're afraid that um, there wasn't really a genuine relationship to begin with. And so there's really nothing to apologize for because it wasn't the apology is not going to be a sincere one anyway. And maybe they're realizing that it's too late and they're realizing too late that there really isn't much of a relationship right, there. Exactly. They've tried to make so it. They're not, one. they're not going to accept it. No. Right. Maybe they were just realized, Oh my goodness, I thought this was something real and it's, mm-hmm. it's not. So yeah. it's too late. Even but the gig is up. The gig is definitely yeah. up. And the, basically that the chorus, it's too late to apologize. It's too late. I said, it's too late to apologize. Yeah. And then they finish with going back to the beginning. I'm holding on to your rope, got me 10 feet off the ground. Right, which speaks to this repetition thing that yes. it just keeps going on and on and they rope you in and they think that they're going to think they're going to esteem you and make you great and then they cut you loose and yeah, it's just the repetition principle. And for that, we're going to have to uh, get get more next week, so we hope you repeat to watch us next week. And this has been Dr. Judy WTF for What the Freud. I'm your host, Walt Lusk, with Dr. Judy Rosenberg. She is actually the founder of the Psychological Healing Center. And if you want to learn more, and um, she's giving away still free consultations of about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And Me and my staff. And she and her staff. And they really are very serious about helping everyone. And all you got to do is reach out and call and contact uh, the psychological yeah, we have center. a lovely staff and, and people uh, and a growing take staff. on ca- cases yes. for um, fees that are very affordable. Very affordable. And um, yeah. so, yeah, feel free to reach out to us and, uh, yeah. And you can catch us, of course, on YouTube, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, and... Um, and our app. And, of course, lastly, the app on iPhone. It's being developed on uh, Android right now. It's a Psychological Healing Center app. And you can get a plethora of information off the app as you well. You could also read a part of the book, Be the Cause, yeah, Healing, Seven, Human Seven Disconnect. Is, uh, the preface is on the app, and you can have a read. And it's a fabulous Christmas gift. So with that, we're going to close out with our, our song. Next week, we are going to do our final child of a narcissistic family. We're going to talk about the uh, mascot or the yes. clown. Yes. So stay tuned for that. And thanks so much, and God bless everyone. <laughs>